we'll go ahead and get started uh, with our conversation, then we'll get you off to one of the, the three dozen receptions and events later on this evening. Uh, my name is John Bailey. I just am so excited uh, you are, are taking time to join us. Uh, and for this panel and for this conversation, um, we are in a, a very sort of weird uh, period right now, especially with election cycles. It's, it's what often gets termed a mega election cycle. Usually you have some governor's races. Yes, you have a midterm. This one, just to give you a sense of the numbers, uh, that uh, in November, voters are going to be choosing not just the outcome of the congressional midterms, but 36 gubernatorial races. We have 30 lieutenant governor races, 30 attorney general races, uh, all of which have impact on education policy, early childhood policy, workforce. It shapes uh, the outcomes of this are going to shape funding. It's going to shape the regulatory environment. Uh, not just with Congress, but also these state races, because that is like where so many key decisions are made in terms of how American rescue dollars are spent, which projects are prioritized with the, Amer uh, with the infrastructure bill, uh, as well as with the, the new broadband plans are gonna be developed and implemented with these new governors and these new state leaders. And so it's really important for us to understand what is happening in terms of the political dynamics, how is that gonna shape the outcome of the November elections, and what does it mean for education and for higher education and for workforce? And so we have an amazing panel. Uh, we have uh, Kai Chen Yo. Did I nail it? Okay, good, finally. Uh, who's a partner with Echelon Insights, has been a great partner uh, with us at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and also at the Walton Family Foundation. We have Brian Stryker, who's a partner at Impact Research, also been a great partner at the Walton Family Foundation. Robert Blizzard, also a partner at the Public Opinion Strategies. Uh, and also been a great partner for us in philanthropy. And so um, we're just gonna dive into it. Uh, first, set the stage. Brian and Robert, we'll go start with you first, Brian, and then Robert. What is top of mind for voters right now? I know when we were thinking about this panel, we were just still in the middle of Omicron. We're thinking about learning loss and kids are, they're gonna be in school. Now all of a sudden we have Russia, Ukraine, we have inflation. There's just, the, it's amazing how much has changed from the moment we thought about this panel to now. So what's top of mind for voters? We'll start first with you, Brian, and then and Robert. Yeah, I, I, and it, it really has changed <clears throat> month to month, and especially in state elections. When you were six months ago, you would have seen education really at the top of the list. You saw it at the top of the list in Virginia in the, in the elections and policies around COVID and around things like critical race theory and sort of other, other education hot button issues. Education was a big deal in that election. Um, right now, nationally and even on a state level, we're seeing it drop, and what we're seeing is uh, the economy, cost of living, uh, rising prices, specifically gas and groceries, meat and milk. Um, Ukraine is second or third on the list. It's sort of real for people, mm -hmm. particularly Democrats, but not only Democrats, but still behind those pocketbook issues. So it really is just so pocketbook driven and, the, and the, the cost of everything and the challenge of getting things and even when yeah. you can get them, they're expensive, is really number one for people. Okay, great, Robert. Yeah, I uh, make it a habit not to disagree with Brian when he's right, um, <laughs> which is exactly true. The voters' personal financial situations is really, I think, what's driving everything right now. Um, you, they can't even look to now other issues. Even even Ukraine, Russia, I feel like is only, I don't know what your polling's shown, but what I've seen recently is now it's even like a third or fourth tier issue mm -hmm. behind the economic anxiety, behind inflation, behind the cost of living. Um, with Republican voters in particular, uh, we're also seeing uh, the border, illegal immigration rising is an issue. I think that's going to increase um, in terms of issue priority for Republican voters, especially with what's going on now and, and Biden kind of rescinding that uh, Trump asylum order. I think that's going to be uh, a significant issue. And then I think under the radar um, is also this cultural war that's going on right now. I think we are living in a cultural civil war in this country between you know what we see as kind of the far right, and I know we're talking about this maybe some more on this panel, mm -hmm on the far right in terms of, uh, you know, just uh, cultural differences between where the far left is. And I think you have a, a big, wide middle of the country that is very focused on other things uh, in terms of their own finances and their own uh, costs and, and are kind of caught in the middle of this tug of war uh, culturally right now. 
All right, we're going to talk about the culture wars um, and tensions, because that's going to be really important, especially for education companies working in a curriculum. I, I'm going to pull in Kai, but one, just one quick question. So on the economic front, I mean, help, me, help, help us make sense, because on one hand, we just had a monster jobs report, labor market report on Friday. Uh, you have people quitting jobs at record rates, and usually quits are a measure of confidence in the economy, that you, you only quit a job when you know you can find another job. So I know this has to be so frustrating for President Biden and the Biden administration, because they have all these top-level economic indicators saying the economy is going really well, but voters just don't seem to be responding to it. Help, help unpack why that is. Oh, I'll bring in Kai in a minute. I will, well, you, you jump in on that first, Brian. <laughs> well, I think that people expected the jobs to come back. That was an expectation they had. Once we stopped, you know, closing everything down and, and sort of all these capacity requirements on restaurants and stuff like that, maybe it happened quicker than they thought. Maybe it happened slower. They don't, they don't really know. But they believe the jobs are back. If you want a job, you can work today. But the, but the problem for people is that costs are going up 8%, their pay is not going 8%. Yeah. For, for two reasons. One, just the average wage is not going up that much. But then also, the cost of gas goes up on everybody. The cost of meat goes up on everybody. But not everybody gets a raise. So even if the average pay goes up 8%, a lot of people got 20 A heck of a lot of people got nothing. So it just, they were not expecting just to be hammered in their pocketbooks. Yeah, one number you're going to hear a lot from our side of the aisle in a lot of political advertisements going into the fall is $5,200. Because right now, the average American household is spending $5,200 more this year than they did last year. That is a, if you're making an average, what's the average household income, 50 grand? I mean, if you're, ma that's a significant increase. Groceries, gas, uh, clothing. Families making decisions, hey, do I, can I fill up my car with gas this week, or do I have to save some of that money to send Timmy to soccer camp over spring break? Yeah. Those are, you can't even think about jobs numbers or unemployment rates when, you, when you're making those kind of financial decisions. I just finished a national poll, um, rather, uh, sorry, a statewide poll yesterday where 43% in a northeastern state said that they were either struggling to, uh, to make ends meet or were living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that's, uh, w there is a significant yeah. financial strain on a lot of families across the country. All right, that's helpful. Kai, so the amazing thing about uh, Kai and the team at Echelon, they've been polling parents almost since day one of, I think it was, when did we start the polling there? It was in, not March, April, probably May. So almost every month they've been doing polling of parents throughout the whole pandemic. So it's, it's the most like, robust longitudinal set of data from how parents experience shutdowns, school closures, Delta, Omicron. Like, what are some of the big trends you're seeing with parents and where are they now? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're seeing the same trends when it comes to registered voters as far as the quality of K-12 uh, K education, uh, education dropping off as more of a voting issue. And of course, this is consistently a top five issue um, for parents. But what's even more notable is when we compare results right now among parents versus registered voters overall, even more parents um, say that they're concerned about the cost of living, that, that say that they're concerned about the cost of housing. Um, and when pushed on this, you know, majorities are very concerned that these types of everyday pocketbook issues are going to become a significant problem for their families. So in some ways, you know, having a young family makes parents even more aware of these day-to-day -day issues, which are going to be, play a major role in the elections. Do you have any sense of, um, I mean, just building on the, the, the cost, the 5,200 or whatever the amount is, that, that's a lot, that crowds out other things. So that summer camp, tutoring, has anyone done any polling on what that, how that changes a family's prospects for higher education? Are we too new, is it too soon to kind of get a sense of if families will pull back on higher ed? Well, I, I mean, for most families, the higher education is becoming more and more unaffordable anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I think now you're just, you're just pushing the goalposts back, if you will, a little bit now on families. I haven't seen anything. I don't know if, if you guys have on that um, specifically or not. I do know that in addition to the cost of living and inflation, especially when you look at polling among younger voters um, and recent college graduates, the high level of debt that folks are facing right now 
not just student loan. I think everybody starts talking about student loan debt, but try to buy a, a, a nice two, three bedroom house in a decent community now. I mean, yeah. across the country. I mean, the, the rising costs everywhere, it's, people are taking on more debt now, not just from school or past things, but in order to live their lives. That's right, yeah. All right, so before we look ahead to the midterms, let's look back. I know uh, all eyes were on the Virginia race with Governor Yonkin and Terry McAuliffe, and using that as a little bit of um, a bellwether of what issues we're gonna have salience for the, the upcoming midterms. And so I'm gonna start with, with Brian, because you did a, a post-mortem memo for, uh, for Democrat candidates and just really sort of tried to assess of what happened there. And so, I mean, what, what, did, your, what did you find? What, was, what are real concerns? What are some of the myths, too, that, uh, that came out of that? So I think with the context of Virginia being a state that Biden had won by double digits, I think you saw, I, I, I agree with Robert about the culture wars being really important. They were a little less important there when you look at some of the, particularly some of the deep blue suburbs where you saw a lot of bleed from Biden down to where McAuliffe ended up. Those voters, I mean, we did focus groups among Biden Yunkin voters, and there were a lot of them. And there was some concern about, you know, a few people raised critical race theory or raised gender, you know, age appropriate, mm -hmm gender and sexuality and that sort of thing. But really what dominated at that point in terms of education was the closing, right? Their kids had just gone back to school and they weren't sure their kids were gonna go back to school that August until maybe a week or two before. I mean, you're a uh, uh, Northern Virginia parent, so I think you can sympathize. Um, but uh, they didn't have any sense that their kids were gonna stay in school, and frankly, a lot of them were right because in January, their kids were right back out. And they didn't think that Terry McAuliffe cared at all. I mean, they didn't think that Democrats cared. They, they didn't think that Democrats understood that there was a cost to all the school closures. And I think that's where Democrats really got, they lost the plot on COVID, was people wanted protection. They wanted protection for their kids and all this sort of stuff, and nobody, not nobody, but most of the population, particularly of these high-income, high-education, democratic suburbs, they were looking for someone to say, COVID's no big deal, it was never a big deal, it's just the flu. Like, that's not where they were. But what they wanted is somebody to balance the cost of their kids getting sick, their kids getting sick and giving COVID to their family with the cost that we have all seen on kids' education. They wanted Democrats to understand there was a cost, and they didn't feel that. That's great. Robert, I mean, what yeah, have I, you seen? I, I don't disagree with anything Brian said. I, I think um, I'm a little biased as a Northern Virginia uh, parent as well, uh, and we can have a drink later and talk more about how that went for me and my family, or 10 drinks. Um, <laughs> but I think a couple things. One, it was immediately after Young Kin won, a lot in the mainstream press tried to say, well, it was critical race theory. It was... Um, you know, racist attitudes or, or you know, uh, dog whistles from Republicans. That was not the case. Folks were very frustrated with feeling that their voices had not been heard, um, specifically parents, um, that they were just kind of, well, tough, you know, tough. We're going to close schools down and you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, there were actually, I remember uh, even this past year when there was a snow day, um, in, uh, in Fairfax County, um, the uh, Arlington schools had, public schools had to close because the Fairfax County uh, teachers that live, in, the Arlington County teachers that live in Fairfax County couldn't make it to school. And even stuff like that just started to frustrate people and get very angry. I also think outside of education, I think that unfortunately for the Democrats, and we were in this position, you know, a couple of years ago, um, they're running up against a little bit of a buzzsaw in terms of having a true referendum on, on Joe Biden. And we talk more about that when we talk about the midterms. Um, but also, I think Terry McAuliffe was just not a great candidate. Uh, he did not have any energy behind him. There was no enthusiasm there. There was no real rationale for his candidacy other than he had the best name idea of any Democratic candidate in the race. And Glenn, Young, Glenn Youngkin, they ran a good localized uh, specific campaign. And all you heard from Glenn Youngkin was, we want to open schools. We want to cut uh, the grocery tax, you know, costs. And all you heard from Terry McAuliffe was that Glenn Youngkin is Donald Trump. And it, it just didn't work. And I think that's one of the challenges and the, the buzzsaw is that, that the Democrats are going to run into this cycle. Well, and the other thing you heard from Terry McAuliffe was this quote that he had in a debate about 
I don't think parents should be involved in education, and Glenn Youngkin must have, uh, you know, spent $10 million playing that thing on loop for a month, and everybody in those focus groups heard it, and they were mad. So I, I just, I mean, I mean, amazing, amazing insight, but some of the simplistic narrative coming out of the Virginia race was that CRT was this animating thing, and so now... Uh, Mike Pence just came out with an agenda two days ago, and it has you know anti-CRT language, a curriculum transparency, and other folks are. I mean, how how big of a role did that issue play? Was it just in Northern Virginia, or was this an issue that really mobilized voters uh, in conservative circles throughout the state? How how would you think about that? You know, I, I think with with critical race theory. Look, when I've polled on it, and I've mm -hmm. polled on it not just in Virginia, nationally, in other states. I don't know if there's really there much there there. I don't think that a lot of folks really understand, unless you're, again, hardcore right or hardcore left, I, it's not something that's in the common vernacular for people. I mean, even when it was hot, I remember doing focus groups in a, in a state for an education-based client. And organically, I don't think critical race theory came up at all. Mm. Um, and in a couple of those groups, you had conservatives. But I think my point is, I'm interested what Brian thinks about this, is I think there was a lot of frustration about misplaced priorities. We are, the schools are closed, there's significant learning loss, people are frustrated their kids aren't learning and test scores are going down and all that, but we're talking about critical race theory, we're talking about changing the names of schools because of you know, some woke ideology thing. And I think there's, again, a lot of people in the middle that are like, hey, my kids just need to learn how to read and write mm -hmm. and do math at grade level, mm -hmm. and they just weren't getting that. And I think that's where all this frustration really built up. Well, but Kai, you, I mean, that's a, it's a great segue because you have done, in Echelon's done some amazing work on trying to understand where voters are on teaching complicated parts of our history and uh, complicated issues with race and and so you've done some great work for, um, for PINET and for others. Like, what, what is your research telling you? What, what is it that parents want in terms of, of some of these issues? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the reality is that these issues are going to be taught in classrooms in some way, shape, or form. And it's not a hopelessly, you know, polarized environment by any means. I mean, when, we're, when we push on issues like systemic racism in the classroom, um, unconscious bias in the classroom, those are very polarizing issues. But the truth is there's really strong support on both sides of the aisle for making sure that kids learn to celebrate you know, diverse environments. Um, and for making sure, there's support on both sides of the aisle for making sure that classrooms are a place where kids learn to be proud of the United States and learn a very full history of what's gone on in the United States, and that includes America's racial history. And when this is brought into classrooms, um, it's, it should be both positioned as something to show children how far we've come, and even maybe uh, broach into how far we may still have to go. But the one thing that parents really don't wanna see is this emphasis on um, pitting students into different groups and pitting them one against one another. Right. I mean, other thoughts? No, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that on the same day that Terry McAuliffe lost, you had a lot of people, fringe right-wing candidates for school board in Wisconsin and Ohio run for school board on, I'm going to stop critical race theory. And people were like, how about educating my kid? Like, I don't care. Like, educate my kids. What are you not hearing from us? They've been sitting home yeah. for a year learning nothing. Yeah. So like that was that was the part where parents they're gonna they flip out on sort of both sides on this because they're just so frustrated. And and I think the point that you make, I mean you you're talking about it very much in a way that Barack Obama talked about race in his campaign and, and being proud of America and still sort of pointing to the you know, that doesn't mean you have to gloss over the sort of past sins of the country, right? You can still be proud of it. And that's very much where he is. That's very much where voters are. I mean, they just they don't want to be told that America is evil. They don't want their kids divided, but they also want their kids to know about slavery and know the evils of it. Like they don't even like they're not okay with. It's not just that they're okay with it. They like they want their kids to learn that. So maybe taking it um, out out of the voter lens for a moment. I mean, we have a, we have a lot of companies both in the room, but also on watching um, on the live stream that. I mean, they're getting pulled into this too. You have, uh, I mean, they're producing curriculum, they're producing content, websites. And so what advice would you give them as they're trying to navigate 
these, these tricky waters because you know, some of the political dynamics in California often want some of the things that are, uh, actually trigger uh, some, of the, some of the laws and, and cross a lot of thresholds in like a Tennessee or other states. So how, what advice would you give companies as they're trying to navigate these, these tricky waters? How do you want to start with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that, I mean, the main thing to remember is if you want the broadest audience possible, it's to contextualize these issues within historical context. I mean, there is strong support for making sure we're focused on the history um, of what's been happening, but not so much you know, focusing on maybe the ills of society right now. Um, there's strong support among parents for making sure that we're encouraging these kinds of conversations maybe outside the classroom, but they don't necessarily want to be told, want their children to be told inside the classroom that um, they are part of a certain group, that they don't want their children to be told that they're part of, you know, an, an oppressor group in any way, shape, or form. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's strong support for shaping these kinds of curriculums by teaching a wide range of literature from different voices, for, by teaching about historical figures that maybe weren't taught about before. So there's unconventional ways to approach these kinds of issues without being so blunt about it. Great. Robert, Brian, any thoughts on just what you're seeing? And I mean, some of this seems, I, mean, the, what, I, I think the thing that's shocking is all three of you are saying there's a, there's a really big middle lane on this outside of the ideological extremes, but it doesn't sort of feel like that in a lot of other, I think, education conversations where it feels more existential that they're worried about their curriculum getting banned or their books getting kicked out of a library. And, and I mean, just how, do, how, should they, how should companies that are a little bit more distant from, from Tennessee or Oklahoma or Texas, like how should they be thinking about it? Well, I, I think for one, I think that a lot of these companies in their corporate comms offices need to get off of Twitter and hire somebody on the stage or somebody else to actually do a poll and do some research and figure out where the public is, where the constituency is. I'll give you an example. The Disney thing, okay? I mean, what Disney is doing now is they have, they have put themselves at the forefront of, again, one of these education ticking time bombs. And, I mean, we just did a national survey that we released last week. Um, when you actually gave the language of the, the don't say gay bill, two-thirds of voters, or I think it was like 60-something percent, support the bill, including a majority of Democrats, including a majority of people that know someone who is LGBTQ. And I think there is such an overreaction, a quick, oh, we need to do this, we need to get on this because of all of the crap that comes from folks on Twitter and from kind of the vocal minorities, and this is just on this example, the same thing's gonna happen in the future on the Republican side with conservative voices attacking something. And I think that companies just need to really understand what their constituency feels before they just jump in with both feet into the deep end of the pool without really understanding what the, what the, what's gonna happen. I mean, I could show you a lot of bills that when people actually read the text are popular, right? Um, but uh, I, I do think, I think you're right. And I think it's hard because um, the people deciding the policy often are at the extremes and they do have an agenda, right? And so I think that um, most people in Texas and California probably want their kids to learn the same thing. Most people on those two, you know, deciding the curricula and those like do not. So. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really a challenge. I mean, that's a political challenge, and frankly, a lot of those people got into those school board slots or got appointed to them because they want to push the ball forward, and so you end up with these things that just sound crazy to voters, you know, on either side. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, there's actually drawing a thread between all three of you. There's a little bit of um, companies, foundations. They they need better sort of 360 situational awareness. They often hear their policies their priorities or their strategies through their own lens, and they don't have enough diversity of views to know if something's gonna be a tripwire in some of the, so it's just, I think, casting a wider net on some of that. But look, we, you all were talking about this, especially in the Virginia race, but I mean, we're just coming out of two years of massive disruptions to childcare, uh, to, to K-12, to higher education. I've been hearing more stories now of kids that are getting no emits because of the bulge that you know kids took a gap year and now all of a sudden you have twice the number of people applying for colleges, so all this is creating huge huge frustrations. Uh, Robert Bryan, you all just did a poll for Walton, and it, one of the most amazing things came out of that is like the average parents said their kids missed 21 days of school this year because of quarantine. So it's this hidden disruption that 
yes, like 98% of schools are open, but kids are still not in school because of quarantine or isolation protocols. Uh, so out of all this, in, in looking ahead, what is your polling saying that parents want? Do they just want to go back to normal? Do they want something different? What is it that parents want from school systems going forward? And maybe we'll just go down yeah, the aisle here. I, I think before, I, I think, look, what, you have a political environment right now that is extraordinarily negative, right? You've got national right direction, wrong track numbers, what, 30, 40 points underwater. The president's approval rating, 15, 20 points underwater. Nobody likes Congress, unless you're, you know, family and friend of Congress or congressman. And, and, and then maybe, you know, who knows. Um, <laughs> when you have that negative political environment, it's it breeds reform, it breeds change. It means voters are more likely to support doing things differently. And I think especially when you look in the education space, you know, every poll I've seen and done, and O'Brien, we've done a bunch, where right now there's a, a lot of frustration about the direction of public schools, the direction of education. And I think, again, that's, that's helpful for those who want to reform and, and do new things. I think on the Republican side, and I'm interested in the Democratic side for Brian, on the Republican side, I think before we, as Republicans, get to that point, I think they want change, they want big change, they want reform. We want schools open, we want kind of things back to normal. When I mean normal, I don't mean curriculum normal. I mean schools open, kids going to school five days a week. The other thing we saw in that survey we did for Walton was, what, do you remember the number that had not had their regular full-time teacher all yeah, year? It was like two-thirds or something crazy. You remember that, John? Yeah, it was like 30 percent. Yeah, I mean, the question was, uh, if when your kid went back to in-person learning, how often would they tarp by their full-time yeah. regular teacher? 30 percent said rarely or uh, only sometimes, Yeah, which is a shockingly high number. It just that's, means... And that's what I mean by before we get to that reform part, yeah. things got to be back to that, let's get normal, then we can work on the reform. No, I totally agree, and I think Democrats are in a similar place. I mean, addressing a teacher shortage and paying teachers is one of the most, you know, that's very block and tackle of education as far as voters are concerned, like just that very fundamental thing. But I think that they, got, they want to get back to normal in that way, in the just get my kid in class, have them learning, have it look like it looked, and I don't have to worry about some sort of disruption. But then at the same time, they saw a lot more of their kids' education over the last two years, and some of it they didn't really like, and that's part of what this whole, I think, CRT is something where all this like stuff came from as parents were getting a closer look. Um, but it also leaves them more open to change, especially on the things they didn't like or didn't understand. And so one of the things we also saw, for example, on, on testing was that parents are all open for reforming these tests and making them better for students and giving them metrics that they can actually use to help themselves and have their parents help them improve their education, right? They're open to big changes in the way those are conducted. They still want, they want the test, like that's important to them. But they're open to change as long as we can set that foundation of like, your kid's gonna be in class. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we've actually um, asked this exact question nearly every month for the last year and a half, and it absolutely reflects what we've been saying here as far as the appetite for reform. A majority of parents consistently say nearly every single month for the last year and a half, they want schools to rethink how they're approaching education. They don't want schools to try to, you know, fit a square, a, round hole, a square peg in a round hole and try to go back to exactly how things were the way before. Um, and we've actually found that a plurality of parents are open to uh, some kind of hybrid learning as long as it's consistent. They want consistency. So there's very much an appetite for reform, but there's also a gap as far as whether parents are seeing that kind of reform being implemented. You know, a majority of parents still don't know how schools are using any kind of COVID or pandemic funding in the classrooms, they don't see that happening. And when we're at a point when parents, you know, kids are really falling behind in so many ways, parents want to see that funding put towards both making sure that schools are adequately staffed, but also towards more flexible learning opportunities, more learning opportunities for their students, whether that's individualized learning plans, extracurricular activities. Um, there's a real appetite for change and parents don't necessarily see that change happening. Okay, what, I mean, the, the poll that you've been doing in the National Parents Union, like what else are you seeing trend-wise in terms of what else parents want? Do they want 
summer school this year? Do they want tutoring? Do they, they want more options? Do they want the option of remote learning versus coming in per classroom? Like, yeah, so we have a plurality um, who want flexible options, as in they want the option to be in person or remote. And th this is where there's a huge partisan divide as far as Republican parents do want to be in school um, five days a week, if possible. But when we look at parents overall on both sides of the aisle, it, it shifts to making sure that they want those um, hybrid options as long as there's consistency. And as far as what those kinds of expanded education opportunities look like, there's not a clear preference for one kind of change over another, which I think points to parents knowing that we that their kids need a different kind of learning, but there's no real consensus over whether um, individualized learning plans, putting more funding behind that is more uh, pressing than putting more funding behind extracurricular uh, activities. The only thing that there's really clear, clearly not support for is things like extending the school day, um, the hours in the school day, or extending you know, the hours in the school year. But in terms of unconventional solutions, I think parents are really open to um, suggestions for their kids. So I agree with all that, and I think one of the pieces of context, I mean, you've done a lot more work on that than me. One of the pieces of context is some polling that, that we did that showed that two-thirds of parents, and the tests are starting to bear this out, two-thirds of parents think that their kid fell behind in the last two years during the pandemic. So, I mean, they're right. Um, so, I mean, it's yeah. horrible, right? But uh, um, So I think that's why you see parents sort of searching for, I don't know, but something. It has to be something. I, I I'd use two words, options and choice. And I don't mean school choice in the traditional sense. They'll be talked about school choice you know, at this summit. But I just mean choice. They want options and choices. Like, to your point, they're OK with hybrid as long as they're choosing whether their kid goes to hybrid or, or not, or, or in person, or stays home. And I feel like, especially going back to the Virginia governor's race, a lot of parents, we did qual boards, which are kind of like these online focus groups among parents in Virginia in the lead up to the, to the gubernatorial race. And that to me was one of the striking findings among parents was they felt like they were out of options. They were out of choices. They were being f kind of forced, kind of you said, you round peg square hole kind of thing. Um, and that was the challenge. Yeah. yeah, I saw this in Kai's polling. Um, this time last year, you were asking questions about reopening schools. And a, a lot of parents just said they want the option. They wanted to. Uh, parents had different levels of risk and fear and also different family situations and sending their kids to school maybe they felt we were putting their family at risk but they they felt like decisions were getting made it goes back to some of the virginia issues you were saying too all right so i know we're we're almost at time but let let's real talk uh talk really quickly uh quick question mode terms do you, will any education or workforce issue rise up to the top early childhood child care k-12 higher education job training, do you see anything sort of becoming uh, a top issue in the midterm election debate? No. <laughs> no. I mean, not, here, I'll, yes and no. Okay. In congressional races, federal races this cycle, I don't think there will be much of that discussion at all. But one of the things you mentioned, at, I think, at the start was there are 36 gubernatorial races. Yep. A lot of, we do a lot of state legislative polling at our shop. I, the, I think when you get into some of these state issues, and especially when you have Republican governors looking to win re-election or Democratic governors trying to win re-election, I think touting and talking about some of that at the state level, I think you, you will see more of that on a positive, uh, you know, positive issue frame. Um, on the federal level, I don't think we're going to be hearing or seeing many TV ads or mail pieces or, or digital ads talking about those issues. Okay. Brian, I think. Broadly, not that much, but I think two places where you will see it. One is I do think Republicans, particularly in Republican-leaning states, will try and pin critical race theory on Democratic candidates, and Democrats will navigate that to you know varying levels of effectiveness. Uh, the other place I think you will see Democrats, particularly in non-college heavy places, is on job training, because there's this perception of Democrats as being the party that wants to pay people to stay home and they don't care if people work and they don't value work and they don't, you know, that, that's sort of like where people think Democrats are. So sometimes talking about helping people get the tools to get a job and get a raise and dealing with the high cost can make Democrats sound 
there's a cultural aspect to the value of hard work that yeah. um, is beyond the training program. Okay. Yeah, and I would agree. It's not really going to be an issue, let's say, in congressional races and Senate races. Um, but one thing we also do is a lot of digital listening. Um, and what we're already seeing in gubernatorial races is uh, candidates, candidates really capitalizing on some of the easy wins, on some of this really strong appetite for reform, uh, specifically around standardized testing reform, places that are safe to, where, the, where there's a pretty safe, broad consensus that we need change. Um, that's absolutely going to come up in gubernatorial races, even if it's maybe not a top two issue. What, what about at the, with um, the national races, the, the congressional races, what about student loan uh, forgiveness? Because I wonder, does, that, does inflation actually give that some tailwinds as a salient issue, or is that not really the case? I mean, we've pulled that issue a lot because it's something that comes up in Democratic primaries, and it, like, it, it, sometimes it pulls okay on the surface, but the problem is when you actually talk to people about it for five minutes or five seconds, they have two complaints. One is most of this country doesn't have a college degree, and they didn't pay for college because they didn't go to college, and then the rest of the country has a college degree and probably paid for college, mm -hmm. right? So there's a very small slice of people you are giving money, and then 50 to 60 year olds, right, the average voter is 55, is like, well, I paid for college, or I paid for my kid's college, so why are they getting it for free? So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real challenging political issue for Democrats, especially in an environment where people think we've given out so much money to people, yeah. uh, and that's part driving inflation and all that. I love the idea other than that, but. Okay, <laughs> other than that. Uh, all right, so we have just under three minutes left. So we'll just go down. Uh, again, we, we have so many entrepreneurs in the audience. We have investors. We have some school leaders. But, but thinking about the entrepreneur, a, a business CEO that's coming to you, and they're just, they're just looking uh, at just uncertainty, uncertainty about funding, about who's going to control Congress or the regulatory environment. Uh, they're trying to navigate the CRT issues, the curriculum transparency. What's like one piece of advice you would give an entrepreneur as they're facing all this uncertainty uh, in the months ahead? Kai, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, well, when we're specifically looking at the K-12 space, I think the biggest piece of advice is to capitalize on the appetite for change, capitalize on parents' desire for a solution that is not clearly defined right now. You know, there's no one solution that's winning. There's just a need for a solution to cater to the needs of a student body that's facing a lot more challenges than previous ones. Brian? I... I just think understanding how much challenge people are facing in their daily lives and how hard it is for people out there right now. And I think uh, showing some empathy for that is really a good place to start. Yeah, I don't have anything really to add to that. I would say just be, again, as I said kind of earlier, understand your constituency. Mm -hmm. And I think, to your point, I mean, change, be for change. Uh, you know, this is, again, this is, we ask in all of our national surveys, right direction, wrong track. We are now going on 19 years uh, of more voters across the country thinking things are off on the wrong track as opposed to moving in the right direction. It is the longest sustained period of pessimism in American history. Mm. And it, be for change. Okay. I was going to say that's a really down, down way to end the panel. Uh, You're sorry. Be, be Your for stay change. off Twitter was yeah. really good, though. Stay yeah, off Twitter right. is stay like off great. Twitter. Stay off of Twitter and be the change you want to see. That's the, that's the message here. All right. Well, will you join me in thanking uh, these folks flew out all the way for this. So thank you for giving up your precious receptions. Now you're all released. Go find some receptions. So thanks, all.